All right, everyone, we're back with the Philosophy of Art and Science podcast. Today, we are joined by our sister, Heiwan, all the way from Germany, but she has been in a lot of places, including Ethiopia, including the United States. She has a lot of experiences that I think are relevant to some of both the religious and the political historical concepts that have been covered on this program. But I always like to greet people in the various languages. I've, I've used Spanish, English, Amharic on this channel, and I've, I've used some guz, but usually the guz is one way. Today, it gets to be uh, two ways. So let me say salam lucky. <laughs> <laughs> but I think you're you're exaggerating my skills. Oh no! Oh no! Oh no! I serendipitously, uh, or you can say providentially, ran into Heywan through Twitter, through um, my father following, uh, and he doesn't really have an account, but <laughs> he follows people anyway. Uh, a very great sports journalist who happens to be Heywan's friends as well, and who I think sometimes was either commenting or retweeting one of her pursuits of public kind of a public form of humanities there there are a number of people doing public humanities there's a guy who does the character of jefferson from north dakota um, who plays in character there's lin-manuel miranda who has the very popular hamilton musical and th those are you know one form of of doing a public humanities where the humanities are usually you know trapped in academia um, but heywan is taking kind of good studies along with my friend David Spielman or Dawit and and me to some extent is, is trying to present some ideas from Ethiopian studies and Gutz studies to the public. So I'm not trying to say you're uh, one of the Gutz Ligawans, but you're definitely someone popularizing. I think Gutz in a small way in social media. Is that is that fair? It is. It is. I think, uh, and also it's been quite a surprise seeing how many followers the that Twitter account has had in just a few weeks. Right? It's only been two weeks, uh, and I've only been tweeting words like um, from Monday to Friday, but then the amount of engagement I've received from people, uh, the comments and messages, people definitely want to study the language or to be at least familiar with some of the words, right? And also yeah. because it's the basis for Amharic. You get to see how one word is in Amharic and how it is in Giz, and then you see the changes. I think it's interesting for a lot of people. I, I agree. I, I think there's a statement sometimes people say that so-and-so doesn't want to learn this or so-and-so doesn't want to learn this. I think it's mostly an issue of the style of teaching more. I I know I was super passionate about math and science. And at one point I got one particular teacher I can trace it back to that really turned me off. And I, you know, I hated math and science for a long time. You and I off air were talking about a little bit how, and we can get to it later, we're both interested in the the real world risk institute side of Twitter or the Nassim Nicholas Taleb Twitter, which, you know, has this form of independent scholarship in the humanities, but does not tie it alone, always is backing it and and tying it to their work in in STEM for complexity studies. And so I, I know you have that that mutual interest as well. And and so I think the light in which you're painting Giz might be different. Maybe the last time they saw Giz was, you know, with all due respect, from one of our clergy maybe smacking them with a, a part of a tree, maybe with a wayrazaf or something. And so you you're presenting it maybe in a in a much kinder manner. I mean for some friends they never had um, that experience either, right? Um, most at this hour, they only go to those who go to the Ethiopian Orthodox churches, hear it during Kadasi, and that's it. And it's limited to that. Uh, people do not actually actively learn it is in, in Addis Ababa unless at a, it is at the Baata school or at those theological centers where you actively want to learn these things. But as an urban dweller, it is far removed from your life, really. Well, right now, actually, what, what is very interesting is there's this um, renewed interest in, uh, in old Ethiopia. In historically, mm -hmm. and you see a lot of friends and and uh, given people in media popularizing the idea of Giz. There's a number of schools that have opened in the past few years trying to teach Giz to Ethiopians, and also almost a patriotic um, attachment to it, right? And you're but referring to in Ethiopia, or you're noticing trends outside as well? In Ethiopia, is mostly outside. There is uh, the Center of Ethiopian Studies in Hamburg, where I am based, that actively deals with uh, Giz. But even that is higher education. It isn't for yeah. young Ethiopians who are who are just interested in the trend. Um, That's right. Yeah. And I I was wondering if you were referring to you know a few years ago the weekend he donated 
50k for good studies and Ethiopian studies at the University of Toronto. Then the University of Washington in Seattle recently started a uh, restarted maybe or or started a, a program as well. But yeah, that's a good point of like the difference between reserving it to the the towers that are ivory and academe versus popularizing it, which is you know again what you're doing in in choosing the the medium of of Twitter. So. I think we we jumped ahead of ourselves. Let let's go back for the folks and let's let's start with an an origin story, if you will. Could you tell us about uh, or summate for us your educational journey so far? I believe you're a PhD candidate right now, and how you got interested in the subject matters that you did because the the route is not so linear, and I I really appreciate that it's not so linear because I think sometimes people try to plan out their whole lives and, you know, man plans. We've got Xavier Rekanawana, <laughs> it's the Lord who actually makes stuff happen. Um, well, I, we've also talked about this previously, Hino, okay? Again, um, my interest in Ethiopian history goes back to the eighth grade where we had a very good history teacher. But then I had to abandon that because I was um, in STEM, studying physics and math. And um, coming to the States, my, my major, I was about to declare a physics and math major at Amherst College, and then it was only two years later because it allows you, Amherst College gives you two years to declare a major. It is two years later that I decided, no, I, I would actually rather be in the humanities studying history. And um, through- But you had taken some prerequisite course, courses still at the undergraduate level in, in STEM, like in any laboratory classes? Exactly, physics, mathematics, and two years, I had I had uh, serious math and physics courses uh, alongside history. And um, so it is only two years later that I decided what I actually want to do is, is study history, most importantly, because I was feeling a, a homesick, right? I missed Ethiopia very much. And then I was also, um, I remember my history professor was uh, Professor Sean Redding. She was also my advisor. And how she studied South Africa, all of that, I, I used to feel as though, why isn't Ethiopia being studied like this, right? Was uh, she a South African herself? Um, no, she was not. No, okay. No. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but my interest was not in, in having Ethiopian studies at Amherst College. I was just con concerned. Why aren't mm -hmm. there history teachers? And, and what would they teach about Ethiopia? Are there historians dealing with this? So for me, it was the, the, the latter, I think the, the next two years of uh, my stay at Amherst College through the various history classes I took, I was studying Ethiopia, almost annoying all my professors, right? Um, <laughs> in an early Christian course, I would study Ethiopia. Uh, Judaism, I would study Ethiopia. Um, West African history, I would write about Ethiopia's relationship to, to Ghana or to Nigeria, right? Um, and then it is immediately after finishing my undergraduate that I decided, okay, I wanted to go to the center of Ethiopian studies in Hamburg, the one that I'm here right now. And, but then I exaggerated for Somali. I went to Oxford instead and pursued a master's in African studies, still studying Ethiopia. And for the first time, engaging directly with urban um, Ethiopian history and, and political realities. So my thesis was on popular music in Addis Ababa and how music was a, a subversive space of um, not just resistance to the Ethiopian politicians and the APRDF or yeah. the government, but just as a space of dialogue, as a, as a space where urban Ethiopians come together to discuss uh, their country and their concerns about their country. And can after you, that- Can you tell us your, your scope then was only during the the current regime from 91 to now, or was it also during the Derg? Was it at all including the Asmari, who are one of the only class of people allowed to make fun of the kings during the monarchy? I, I, I paid lip service to the, to the Asmari. But then my focus was purely, not even 1991, 2005 until 2016. That was my focus. Um, Perfect. Could you could you tell us uh, as an Ethiopian, just for those who are watching who may not know, sometimes, you know, I had someone write to me the other day that they were just absolutely fascinated by some of the videos I was doing with people about Ethiopian history. And even one of the persons in the comments said that they used to be a white nationalist. And so even someone like that is now getting interested in that. I was joking with a friend, you know, people are going to have a, a new pipeline from white supremacy to Ethiopian supremacy, <laughs> the more they learn about it. And so that's what 
<laughs> it's obviously something we have to watch out for. But could, could you just, uh, I know it might sound like over explaining, you know, because you know, I know what it is, but just for the sake of the audience watching, can you tell us what the Asmadi was in the sense of traditional music? And then the kind of popular music, like were you looking at Teddy Afro, Johnny Raga? Who, who were you looking at? Jalud, who are these people? Uh, Hach Alu, who was assassinated? Yeah. Well, okay. So, <laughs> so the Asmari are, are traditional Ethiopian musicians that use the one stringed instrument called the Masinko. But what they're known for is their poetry, their Ghani like poetry. And uh, they were the means by which people would share their, their um, political, social, economic um, concerns. And when music was not, um, it was not very much looked upon, right? I remember the founder of the Yared Music School, Asha Nafi Kabede, said, the only form of art that is appreciated in Ethiopia is poetry. <laughs> None of the musicians are actually, you know, like to be an Asmari is, is frowned upon, right? Um, yeah. But they, through their poems and through their, uh, to, to the, analytical ways of, of understanding their society and their position in life in, in Ethiopia. They made it possible to channel a lot of uh, people's frustrations or even um, good opinions of what was going on. What I focused on was um, by drawing on that, right, by, through, through looking at some of the poems of uh, Old Azamari, um, how that tradition came to post-2005 Ethiopia whether or not musicians were using similar techniques of kene, um to express the opinions of uh, urban Ethiopians. And uh, the musicians I looked at, I did not select the musicians. What I did was I distributed about 500 questionnaires in as many places as I could wow. to, to ask um, people that I found anywhere, right? Bars, cafes, um, shoe shine boys. I remember a lot in Aratkilo, uh, those book vendors and stores and, and a lot of places asking them who the current musicians that they listen to are and uh, what they, they admire in contemporary Ethiopian music, what they wish would change, right? And interestingly, of course, number one was Teddy Afro. Everybody mentioned Teddy Afro um, because of his position to, <laughs> to EPRDF after the 2005 elections, right? Um, but then most people noticed one of the growing trends that most people spoke of was the growing patriotism that was seen in Ethiopian music. So already in 2012, 2013, especially after the death of Mendes Zenawi, the, the, the prime minister, right? The strong hand. Um, after that, there was a sense, I think, among the urban Ethiopian community that uh, there was a, an existential threat to Ethiopia. And mm -hmm. this was federalism. And so a lot of musicians started singing about the unity of the country, the unity, uh, uh, um, the diversity, how people tolerated each other for 3,000 years. So all of this became dominant in urban political music. I'm sorry, I have fruit flies. This is, this is what's going on. No okay. worries, it's because the, the language you're using is so toom, it's so sweet, that's why. <laughs> it's attracting the fruit flies. It's You know what? It's very interesting what you're saying about the... Um, the way in which you were polling people and asking them and, and how they were critiquing the regime as it stood while getting nostalgia for the things of the past. It's, it's something that I had mentioned, you know, before is when people saw the, the bloodshed of the hyper westernization, hyper Marxism, which is, you know, in a sense brought on by the modernizing kings like Theodros, Menelik, Johannes, and Azehaile Selassie. In a sense, you know, they're they're building the things that destroyed them. They're they're making all of these, you know, Western into institutions, French schools, Italian schools, all these things. And so people pursue that that uh, you know, our parents and grandparents, probably grandparents are the first group of real modernizers, and then parents are are coming in and you know, they are saying we want to abandon everything in the past and go only for the new stuff. But you're saying that some people who saw the results of only focusing on the new said we're okay with new stuff, but I think there might have been something good in the past. Not that it was all good, but there might be something to this past thing. We yes, we have definitely gone off the rails somewhere. And and right now there's you know it's um when you follow contemporary Ethiopian politics, 
you might think that there are two sides to how people see where they stand, right? Some say there's the unity camp, some say no, there's the other side of that, the ethno-nationalist camp. What I see even within, within the unity camp is a lot of confusion about uh, what part of Ethiopia people are, uh, are, are, are aspiring to hold on to. There are people who, because the past 27 years, not, not just the past 27 years, but since the Derek, since the end of Haile Selassie, because Ethiopian history has been, um, you, have, you don't learn proper history in schools. You're not educated as to, there, there's no historiography that teaches you this is okay, this is bad. You, the techniques of learning history are not there. So people are not sure what Ethiopia is exactly, right? Symbolically, they understand what uh, the past was, but not mm -hmm. really. So there are people who, who, who will tweet even on Twitter or who will share their opinions saying Ethiopia has 7,000 years of history and that is what we're holding on to, right? So there is an extreme to this as well. And this is mm -hmm. born out of, uh, most definitely out of ethnic federalism, uh, a system that has forced people not to know about their past. And then there's a generation saying, okay, now we want to know and we're going to hold on to whatever we can. Um, and so- If I may modify, you hmm. use the term ethno-federalism. I, I think what's worse than even ethno-federalism, right? It's it's a pseudo ethno federalism based off of linguistics, which is imposed top to down, as opposed to the federalism that in some shape, way or form has existed in the Horn of Africa for that period of 7000 years you're talking about, but has not existed in a coherent, powerful, bureaucratized nation state except for you know the 1800s till now. One point that I keep coming across in the kind of social media slideshows and presentations of history that people keep presenting that frustrates me is, uh, you know, I had a tweet this morning, history didn't start in 1991, history didn't start in 1974 or five, it didn't start in the 20th century or the 19th century, you know, I, I went through with a friend of mine the the millions of he years of history from Dinkanesh to the yeah. Aksumites, you know? That's really where, I mean, just to get a real grand picture of, you know, are there differences? Yes, you know, but what periods are they from? Because I see I see a lot of people, you know, they want to begin history with with uh, Aseminilik, and it's like, that's not where history began, um, but, it, you know, it's, it's, an, it's an interesting point that you think it stems from the the ethno federalism. I wanted to ask you, what do you, what do you think about the 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 form of the kingdoms, the the fiefdoms, the sultanates, and itself? You know what? You know the closest thing to what Oromia was, right? Was the the Gada system. W what do you think of those forms of ethno federalism in comparison to the ones established from 1991 till now? Do you view them as the same thing, or are they different things? Not necessarily the same thing, right? Because um... Hmm. You know how I study humor and jokes. For my, my that's what my thesis is on is popular jokes and at the and uh, yes. And when um, so in nineteen when was it in nineteen ninety three? Right before the the constitution, the EPRDF constitution was ratified. Melazinawi and all those the, the new members of the Ethiopian government um, held a meeting, asking representatives from the fourteen zones of Ethiopia to. Uh, consult the people and then to come into a consensus to ratify this constitution. Mm -hmm. And one of the members that I, I study is uh, Shalak Admasi. He is a hilarious man in parliament. And he kept on saying, you know, in my, he, he represented Addis Ababa, one of the people who represents Addis Ababa. He said, in, my, in the Kavali, where I was supposed to have spoken to people too, 17,000 um, invitation cards were given only about 32 people showed up. <laughs> and from those 32 people, one uh, about 15 of them was the Kabale leader, his wife, his children, and his family members. And so you are about to ratify a constitution, an ethnic federal constitution without consulting the people. And you are pretending that this is a democratic process and this is wrong. And so what I see different from the Gada system and from the ways that Ethiopia has been administered before prior to even Haile Selassie and afterwards, is there is a sense of the elite trying to consolidate power for themselves. So the concern is not about how to rule Ethiopia, it is about how to stay in power long. 
right? If the ethnic federalism actually had the voice, if Ethiopians had agreed to have this system in place, I would not have a problem with it. If Ethiopians, if, if the Amara said, okay, yes, I agree with this, if the Tigrayans had said the same, if the Oromo had said the same, and that was how the system was put in place, you would respect it. But that is not how it was consolidated. And this is the biggest difference for me, right? Um, it, is, it does not serve the Ethiopian people. It serves a few elite who still to date want to use it for their own purposes. And this is what I see as the difference. Yeah. I have a, 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 a historian, Professor Bayru Tafla. He's, uh, he's referred to as the blind genius in Ethiopian studies, right? Uh, he used to, he constantly reminds me Emperor Minilik's time, there were about 50 Agarat. Agarat would loosely translate to countries, but of course, that's not what it means. Uh, within an Agar, there's an. So, so, so. City states? Yes, exactly. I, I, I'm translating a book right now, and I had trouble with that word because the word is used to describe so many, like, even sometimes like a like a county like a <laughs> Warada or something is a Hagar. Like you're here here. I had a, our bishop um, Abuna Barnabas of uh, his beatitude of Southern California. He talks about where his mom is from in Gwandar versus where his dad is from, and his mom is from this like valley thing right here where you can see the hill. He said the hill cannot be more than a mile away, and. <laughs> He said at her, at, at the um, at his father's funeral, he said that his mother was was weeping, and one of the things that she said was, "Lord, please make sure that I don't die in this foreign country." Look at this. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So Agar, in that sense, even though it's right there, right? Yeah. yeah. There's also, of course, in, in Addis Ababa. Now I consider my Hamlet Mazoria to be my Agar. <laughs> right. Um, so these local sefer, uh, the old, old airport sefer, and Hayat, <laughs> <laughs> you know, stretching the word too far. Um, but what were we talking about? Yes, we, we go ahead. The decentralized form of Ethiopian government. Yeah, government. and you're talking about how the the blind genius was. Uh, say his name again. Professor Bayru Tafla. Bahiru Tafla, thank you. He, he that he was mentioning that there were 50, 50 different. I think city state is a good. Yeah kind of word although i just use the word country a lot just because it's you know it's 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 hard it's hard to keep switching back and forth because you gotta again you know make this distinction the, the common the common i wrote a blog article on this once because it's actually the same thing in in the hebrew word over time and it's because as civilizations expand you know the functional definition is that it's talking about a, a governmental structure over a of over a given territory and the thing that's difficult is that the territory changes over time, right? So in Ge'ez, Hagar is city, and Ahigur is cities. But in Amharic, those words are now used for country and continent, you know? So it's it's just, it's the same functional meaning. It's just that the size of the territory we're talking about has expanded <laughs> greatly. Um, so, so you're saying you wouldn't mind as long as they come from the people. And I think the way in which these borders take centuries of time and and people's natural movements obviously part of those movements are war and conquest but also part of that is like natural marrying and merchants trading and and all that stuff as well is at least more organic than the top down imposition actually my my grandfather's book who which is the one i'm translating right now he wrote in 91 he has part of his family from the famous Walkai to Agadi Humara area, which I never knew where it was exactly geog geographically until recently. I studied it on a map because I never could get quite a picture of it. But, you know, Begemder or what used to be called Gwander is a very large area uh, from the southern part, Debra Tabor and Gaint, all the way north to the border of Eritrea. And so the, the area that had very lush land that bordered Eritrea there are a huge amount of Tigrinya speakers. You know, I've heard some estimates to say that as many as 80% of the people spoke Tigrinya there. Um, but the fact was like 100% of them spoke Amharic. And so, you know, how they identify was perhaps looser than others. And that was one of many territories that was taken from the, one of the historic 14 states or city states you mentioned, Bagemder, and transferred over to the current a Tigray region. And so my grandfather wrote a, a letter of rebuke to the, the regime in, in 91 when they came in power saying, 
you know what, we've lived together for years, we've intermarried, we, you know, we're the same people, we have the same faith, you know, Orthodox Christianity, all these, all these things. Um, and obviously, you know, nobody heard him back then, and he passed away a, a few years after that. Um, but even now, today, even after a lot of displacement and a lot of other things, it's a huge, you know, good dies. That's that's one of the the many uh, unresolved issues in the 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 ever boiling set of issues that that we have back home. So I'm 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 very interested in this idea of qald or jokes that you said. Is this what you said you're you're working on right now in, in Hamburg for your PhD? My thesis, yes, is qaldoj. But as I've told you before, that's not uh that's not the only thing that I'm studying here, right? Uh, there's there's gays, there are those seminars that we take under our advisor. Um but I I wanted to mention one thing that we we mentioned earlier but we quickly go to, uh, went Please. over history about history and how it's taught in Ethiopia I think mm -hmm. uh, I was just reading Professor Lapiso's book on Eritrea and uh, across the book he mentions that Ethiopians do not have a historical tradition that Ethiopians do not have a way of understanding their past and this is repeated by a lot of historians in the past 20 years that subscribe to the idea that one group dominated another in Ethiopia. And uh, I think part of the problem is that we do not appreciate vernacular historians, uh, not just academic historians, but those that write outside the universities. Um, but we can come back to this topic later. I wanted to mention it so we can come back to it, circle oh. back, right? Well, I mean, it's a good one. I don't know if you had another one to get into because that that's a good one to talk about. You mean the way in which, you know, someone who is literate, maybe a random deptera, uh, or cantor of the church versus an officially sponsored court historian who may also have a background in dibtarana or or being a, a cantor or sort of church learning is, is that what you're talking about yes or the oral histories i mean all of that all of that as a tradition that there is a way that ethiopians have recorded their past there is a way there's a systemic way of understanding what people's lives were like in the past right through royal histories, uh, chron um, chronicles, royal biographies, or even um, court historians who would write about not the kings, but like Rasko Bena. He has his own history written about him. And the, the reason I mention it is because I was uh, talking about Ethiopia having 7,000 years and how people are romanticizing this the idea of this country so much right now. <laughs> and that's attached to uh, a lack of um, at least a center that uh, deals systematically with Ethiopian history and honestly and genuinely actually interrogates Ethiopia's past by looking through all of the ways that Ethiopians have been dealing with their past and writing and passing it on to generations, right? And so let's do that. Let's do that. Hatata. What What is problematic, that investigation, what is problematic about saying 7,000 years or even Kabur Professor Efrem Isak has said 10,000 years when he's especially focusing on on the uh, unity of Ethiopians. I believe uh, Dr. Fikre Tolosa has also referenced no. the 10,000. Yes, I, and I think, I, <laughs> Dr. Fikre Tolosa, have you watched his interview with uh, um, a guy on Real Media? No, uh, send me the link and I'll love to watch it. Okay. This tell is, me, this or he could tell us about it, uh, give us a gursha. This is what I was coming to. I do not consider uh, Fikre Tolosa a serious historian. His book has a lot of myth that uh, uh, does not hold true. Um, there are ways, for example, he will mention a word like Mali and he would say Ethiopia span all the way to Mali. Because yeah. the word, so there are, there are things that, uh, um, that are questionable about his book. But my point is, it is exactly because history was not um, one, that Saba University or other universities were not seriously dealing with Ethiopian past studies as seriously as they could have. Two, it was even banned at Addis Ababa University for a while. Did you know this, the history department? I did not. Which period are you referring to? I, I can imagine, though, with two regime upheavals. 2012, 2013, 2014, I think the history department wow. did not have students. Yeah. So there has been a gap, um, a, a systemic or not, that has stopped Ethiopian, young Ethiopians from learning about their past. And uh, those like Fikre Tolosa are... Uh, symptoms of that gap right they they aspire to hold to to create some sort of grand ethiopian narration 
which may not, it's not a bad thing. Of course, it's not a bad thing. But as a serious scholar of history, you th that's not a serious thing to consider as Ethiopia is going to. What, what is, um, and, and this is funny that you say that. I have a friend who's mm -hmm. uh, playing a game called EU4. I don't want to butcher the name, so I'm going to look it up right now. It's called Europa Universalis 4, right? Mm -hmm. And when it has a guide to Ethiopia, it's, it's very interesting. So Europa Universalis 4 and I, along with other people, were, was boosting an Ethiopian expansion pack for a video game called Civilization 6 which has Az Eminelik and Civilization mm -hmm. 5 has uh, Az Ehaila Selassie. So mm -hmm. these games, the Civilization series and the Europa series, refer to various regions. The Civilization is a bit more fictionalized, but my friend was telling me that the Europa un uh, Universalis actually tries to be more historic. So you say there's something wrong with talking about the 7,000 years of history. To refer to some of the fiefdoms or kingdoms we were talking about, here in the game, you can be quote unquote Ethiopia, or you can be Damot, or you could be Hadia, you could be Alodia, Beja, Midri Bahari, Adel, and Kafa as examples within the video game. And you could play as those civilizations and and build out the the political intrigue and the historical intrigue in the in the video game. Is that what you are pointing at when you say the 7,000 years? Or if you wanted to smash that idol, but not just leave it smashed and replace it with maybe, again, just a bite-sized amount of information in terms of, you know, what's a better way of, of speaking? Do you, do you just say, it's better to speak of the 10,000 years of history of the Horn of Africa and the various systems of governance or how, what turn of phrase would you use? I would, I would start by um, asking people to consider the evidences and the sources that allow us to say Ethiopia has 7,000 years of history. Um, from, from my teachers and, and from historians, I can say that Aksum Kingdom would be uh, the point at which we can say, okay, definitely now from here we can trace for a few centuries there has been a civilization around here. And then we can say symbolically that is the founding area of Ethiopia today. So these conversations I can agree to have mm -hmm. and I can say, okay, this is all right. But when someone says, uh, throws it out to 7,000, 10,000, I, I say, okay, it's, it's too long of a time. I understand. <laughs> I understand yes. what you're saying. So there are certain key terms that people use in defining civilization, you know, when they refer to Mesopotamia as the first civilization, is it a, is there a writing system? Are there some buildings erected and, and other things like that? Um, you know, what type of tools do they have? I think these, these things are some of the signs people use. And I think civilization in that term in, uh, is in contradistinction to barbarism, right? Which is, you know, supposed to be just be a, a tribal hunter gatherer type living. And, you know, again, sometimes there's some racism behind even the yeah. looking down upon of hunter gatherers. I just did a piece on on the monk who are among 100 million different people referred to as Zomians by the anthropologist James C. Scott. And they pretty much lived as hunter gatherers, you know, across eight different nation states in Southeast Asia. And they did so intentionally. And they chose not to have a written script. They chose not to pay taxes and they chose to live as hunter gatherers. So it's not necessarily an inferior thing, but that's, that's a technical, you know, definition of civilization. So at bare minimum, I guess what you're saying is let's be more humble and say 2000 years. Let's not, let's not, you know, puff up our chests too yeah. much. Yes. Yes. That's all it is. Yeah. Okay. So that's great. Well, in examining these these things, whether it's, you know, Sabaean script, the G script that, you know, comes from that, or these, these various civilizations, let's cut the window down from 10,000, 7,000, we've cut it down to 2000. So <laughs> in these 2000 years, how do you, how do you go about studying those things? Even, even the stuff you have is not that ancient, right? I think you told me you're more medieval. Is, is that right? The area, the periods you're looking at? Interest, yes. Yes. So how do you examine the Amharic, sometimes called Old Amharic, from that period? I, I see you sifting through manuscripts, which personally, I have issue reading sometimes like people's handwriting and manuscripts versus something that's like a typefaced 
g- script. Um, I'm kind of a baby in that way. I have, for example, a book of Zimmare wa Muwasit, which is one of the books of uh, Yared. Uh, no shade, but if I can quote a mamher that I like, Lik Agubaye Gitahun, he also has questions about whether the people at the Yared's Music Academy have read the four books of Qaddus Yared. <laughs> but uh, I have two of those books, one called Zimmare, one called Muwasit. And it's not printed typeface. So first I have to be able to read what the actual script says. And then comes, that's the fluency, then the comprehension of the guz, which itself I'm far from perfect in. Uh, so I have a lot of issues with that. How how do you go about doing that? Is that a practice? Did you know it immediately? Like how did you, how did you begin like sifting through that to, to study uh, humor and history and guz and all of these matters? But you see, yes, so at first, what you have to know is that my, my thesis is only um, 19th century, 20th century, and 21st century Ethiopia, right? But mm-hmm. uh, the center, um, our classes, our seminars are people who directly deal with uh, ancient Ethiopia, medieval Ethiopia. And so, for example, you would have a course on translating one manuscript from the 13th or 14th century. And even then, it is not typefaced. It is an Ethiopian who an Ethiopian scribes handwriting that you have mm-hmm. to do. And um, sometimes it's incredibly hard, of course. At the times it is easy and you can see the logic behind how one writes. So for example, you can see the changes in how he was written in the past and Hamaruha he would is written today. Um, but since I do not directly focus on these manuscripts, what I read a lot about medieval Ethiopia is translations. Okay. And, uh, so get like Austos. I would have a, a Giz version here and an Amharic version here, but uh, that is the same book, the same manuscript that has been critically edited by. Uh, yes. So for me, it is much easier than yeah. for those who are dealing directly with the manuscript study. And right? do you do you ever see something in the Amharic text that makes you question something and then go check back the manuscript to see, hmm, should I be giving all my trust? Because I imagine you know it's still a human hand, so it's not a it's not a perfect one to one. Yes, of course, definitely. And it's the beauty of it is you see um, how someone who has lived about 600, 700 years ago trying to make sense of uh, uh, translating or even copying a manuscript from somewhere else is trying to deal with how to place it for his contemporaries or for people coming later on. Um, That's right. That's an assumption for a lot of people, in case you don't know. This is all done on goat skin. These manuscripts are on like goat skin. And, you know, the way people are doing this is all by hand. So the whole idea of dipteranna that I mentioned earlier, it's such an all-encompassing word. It's so crazy. I said canter because that's one descri- descriptive factor which, uh, factor, which means that there are people who sing in the church. But they're very learned people. Sometimes they're predominantly the, the educated class. And they meticulously do calligraphy and handwriting the way in which you know in the western tradition you could point to saint benedict and the benedictine monks as people who in the so-called later dark ages were able to preserve all of the texts be they secular or religious of that community it, the the, the, the deptera class in ethiopia has uh, done that for Ethiopian knowledge writ large, which is predominantly Christian, but sometimes, you know, I have a friend on Facebook, Augustine, he's studying the magic as well, you know, so there's, there, it's not all necessarily church sanctioned activities that are being written down. And uh, like you said, there are people in the main court, but there are lesser courts as well, lesser, lesser kings. If you're going to be the king of kings of Ethiopia, there got to be some other kings, right? And sometimes there are Aras or a dead Jasmach, right? A duke or a gate commander is how I've been translating those things. There's this book um, called Guardians of the Tradition that um, lists the, the major historical productions of the country. And I remember, I think it was in the 16th century, uh, a certain Abba Aulos. So he was not a court scribe. He was not. It was just a humble man who could write, and he he wrote a history history of Ethiopia of the time. And so he was discussing the problems of uh, the Grain Warrior, the Grain invasion, and how the Christian Ethiopia was losing, and then also the Oromo invasions of it. And then at some point he also adds, "Sadly, my cows have also been stolen." <laughs> so, <laughs> 
<laughs> that was, I think, one of the, the, the most beautiful things. These are people who are living at the time, who have yeah. their own personal uh, lives as well as uh, trying to do the yeah. You know, it's, yeah, it's good. Quite... <laughs> oh. And uh, and I think that's the you're trying to you're you're putting your place your yourself in the shoe of these scribes and these historians and trying to understand what was going on at the time. And that's that's the... so beautiful. I I was illiterate until nine years ago in mm -hmm. Giz and Amharic. Even though I grew up speaking Amharic in my household, you know, being born and raised in the states, I I didn't have access. My parents say I was too lazy to learn. I don't know. I was a kid when they tried teaching me apparently, and I didn't get this interest until I got the nostalgia later. And especially now it's been nine years since I've been to Ethiopia and this nine year period has been my period of literacy. And it's, <laughs> it's been the time where my Amharic has improved the most. And one of the things I said is I, um, some people would get mad. They'd say, stop practicing on me because I would just speak to them in Amharic. I, I saw them as resources. I saw them as teachers that I didn't have to pay, you know, my families and friends. And so I, I would, uh, just not speak to them in English as much as I could. And so I, I force myself playing in this sort of game. And eventually, you know, Sadar Kacho, you know, when they're getting too frustrated or annoyed, I found books. And the beautiful thing is with the books, the books don't get annoyed when you read them over and over again and take your time to understand them. So through looking at the liturgical rubrics of the church and through reading beginning, my grandfather's memoir was the first book I read. And then I began reading, you know, the books of the Bible. And then I began reading other books as well, you know, mostly religious stuff, but I would read the news as well, whether it's from VOA or, or the, the various, you know, Ethiopian uh, news sources. So, um, you know, trying to sift through everything. So I'm glad that you mentioned, you said you're more 19th century, 20th century, 21st century in terms of your particular subject, even though you, you study and have the tools to study older stuff. But I would submit to you that even 19th century Amharic is going to be difficult for your average Addis Ababawit. So I, tell me if I'm wrong, but your average friends from back home where you grew up in Addis Ababa, in the capital city, their understanding of what Amharic is, how do you relate that? Because even recently I, I read for people publicly this message that Emperor Minilik writes to Abba Jafar. And mm -hmm. even reading Emperor Minilik's message to Abba Jafar, there, there are some weird things in it. It says like, instead of Yemimacho, it'll say like, Itamacho. you know, <laughs> it's like, it, even some of the phrase was awkward. And I remember someone in the comments uh, dared <laughs> to question my ability to read Amharic, uh, diaspora man that I am, but they didn't know that it was my sense of, uh, maybe inferiority complex that led to me becoming better than a lot of these folks. And I told them, look, I did that. I just recorded one cut and went away. I didn't even practice it. I just read it in one go. If I sat there and practiced it, okay, it would be a little bit easier. But even then, I would challenge anyone who's trying to read these things, especially out loud and record it to, to go against me. And uh, I, I'm sure I'll be in the top 10 percentile because it's not easy. It's really not easy, I think. But but you tell me as Addis Ababa, what your friends and your peers growing up, people who would have went to high school with you, uh, what, how would, how, what type of time would they have reading the documents that you're reading from the 19th to the 21st centuries? You know, what's interesting, I, I remember um, talking to my friends before I came to the Center of Ethiopian Studies here in Hamburg, before I started serious good lessons. And then over the years, we had uh, fallen out of touch. And then recently, we, we got back in touch and they said, you're a mark. It's, it's considerably different. <laughs> <laughs> you sound gutare, you sound country now, or what? What do they say? Country, but uh, it sounds like um, it's stricter. Because stricter. you know because you know urban urban Amharic, you know my little brother and his friends talk uh, an Amharic that is completely I just cannot understand what they're saying half the time. They have their own <laughs> words for almost every single thing. And so it's it's gone, right? There's a new sort of Amharic that is developed in town. It's and a dialect. Are, yes. <laughs> mine has been pulled back. Uh, but here I have a look I have this that, wait does that, does that mean that you're just using less English? Because for me uh, like it seems the urbanites who go to private schools, they mm -hmm. just use what I would say, and sometimes even my mom and her friends, they would use, I think, 30 to 40% English. 
And in my opinion, I speak English well. If I'm going to use 30 to 40% English, I might as well abolish Amharic and just speak English. Whereas when I am speaking Amharic, I'm quite strict. I don't mind using, for example, an Arabic word here or there, you know, when those are there, because at least it's a Semitic cousin. But I try my best to not use any Italian, French, or English words that I'm conscious of when we have a word. When we don't have a word, I'm going to say computer. But for example, I'm not going to say bandira when I could say sandak alama. I'm not going to say biro when I could say sifat bet or, you know, uh, masrabit. So is that what you mean is like the, the using other languages or or because there's also a thing of people using almost like slang words that come up that are kind of organically Amharic, which are also uh, which those I like, actually. It is like a ninkau, a ninkau, right? It means let's touch it, but it means let's leave. You've heard, but that doesn't actually mean you've heard, right? Um, that's not what I mean. The slang, I can also, uh, you can get used to it and you can use it as well. What I mean is even the pronunciation, the way you say the words, uh, instead of salam, no, then alish, shaman, no. I see. Way, yes. So it has, it has, yes, a, a certain way. Nebse want- instead of nebse. <laughs> There we go. <laughs> so, and, so tell us about the book that you have before you. It's a Ethiopian records from the Minilikan era, yeah. And this letter is written by um, Minilik and people in court, prompt I to to Alfred Ilg and all of that. And I wanted to see if we can read one of the. Just a please, short please read any of them. Oh, you could you could read the longest one. Oh my God, no, no, no! Because this is going to be embarrassing. Okay, let's see. So it says Moambesa Zem Nagada Yehuda. Dagmai Minilik, see you Magzatir and Gusanagas, the Ethiopia. You dress, Kamuse, Ilk, and date San Betahan, and Exaver in Meskan de Hanani. Levit Ara, Yemihon, Shekla, Agarachin, and Dinasara, Mislun is a Helling, and Ditimata, Yuhun. Bahamle, Asrasan Metkan, Badis Ababa, Katama, Tazafan. So the, the only difference in the Amharic here is the Yuhun, and Ditimata, Yuhun. So we want you to bring us. Uh, Im- images of roof tiles that we're going to use in Addis Ababa. And the Addis Ababa person would understand missile, but they would not say that. No. They would say the picture. Ah, photo. <laughs> photo. Thank you. Photo. <laughs> yes. But uh, it is to show you that even the Amharic, I don't think, has changed that much yeah. from the Middle East. It also opens with G is there. Conquering line of the tribe of Judah, king of kings of Ethiopia, was you just said it in G is, and you said it really quickly. They, I know people who would struggle even to read that, even if they know the phrase, you know? Yeah. yeah. Yes. Yeah. It is only recently that I learned it, uh, it does not actually mean conquering Lion of Judah. It is uh, the Lion of Judah has conquered. This is this was my recent Giz lesson. <laughs> yes. Yes. Yeah. So that's a grammatical point, right? Yeah. It's a question of, is it a gerund, I-N-G, or is it past tense, E-D? But it's the same word, right? To to win, to be victorious, to to conquer. Moa. I actually had a friend growing up named Moa, and people used to always think it was a butchered version of Noah. But oh. without, re, re, they thought it was like Noah, no, uh, like from the Bible, Hamara, no. But they didn't they didn't understand the difference. Um, and there are some interesting names like that. So you're right. So so you would argue then, if I'm not mistaken, that most of them would have no issue reading reading through those letters. Um, no, they would definitely have issues reading those letters because uh, the handwriting is also hard to, to decipher. Um, but I'm saying, uh, handwriting yeah. aside, if they if they could clearly see what each letter represented, I think it, I think most Adisawa would be able to read these letters. Yes, I would. Wonderful. <laughs> That's good. That's good. That's more encouraging than I thought. That means. That means that it is more accessible to more people than than I thought. Could you could you tell us, I guess, without revealing your whole thesis, some of some of the funny things that you've come across in your studies, whether it's directly relevant or not? I could I could think of at least a few of the sayings that you were telling me last time that some of the Debtara class were saying about various kings. And I, the reason I bring this up is. I have been one of the number one critics of the monarchy, of the kings. You know, I'm very American, and America is founded on this distaste for kings. However, seeing the historical inaccuracies spread more and more, 
seeing people refer to people as neo neftanya right as a a new version of a weapon carrier i said man maybe you're going to turn me into a neo neftanya and <laughs> i'm going to be the advocate of the kings now um <laughs> but the history is you know i think funnier i i i think people who study kene or guz poetry happen to be the funniest people in our culture and i don't think it's an accident i see the other traditional schools involving mostly liturgical whether it's eucharistic liturgy or non eucharistic liturgy whether you know digwa kwakwa or kadase those people are doing more rote memorization but the people in the kene and have to come up and construct this is why guz is not a dead language they have to construct new sentences on the daily and memorize them so i think that creative process learns itself for the brain working in a different way that i believe is funny i also believe god is funny and and says that in in the psalms that he sits or is enthroned in heaven and he laughs zayinabr wasta samay yishqomu basamay yemiqamato basamay zufan yallo yilatibachwal and so i think that that humor of god rubs off on on these people but could you share with us any any of the humor from uh you know that that is digestible without giving away all the goods of of your work i can, I can focus on um, so in the part that i deal with the history of humor in ethiopia most definitely alaka gabrahanna also has a, has a major part in this right not just because he criticizes uh, the rulers or theodros johannes and like no but also because his wit is also horizontal it's to his neighbors it's to to the local um man who who has a donkey like he, it is it is no one is spared nobody is spared right nobody is spared and um one of the things i remember the reason that he had to flee um gonde was because as I told you as I told you last time we were talking as I told you just had enough of his jokes and in one of the letters written by I don't know if you know him Dr. Uh, Asagahin No I don't, I don't know him but I do see uh, Emperor Teddy behind you there Oh yes yes he's uh, <laughs> I like him. um <laughs> not of course there's a lot of things to be critical about Teddy but his spirit I like but uh, so there's this letter written to one of the Dabadi brothers to Antoine Dabadi not Michel and uh, it says that alaka gabrahanna was bitten by a, a cane and kicked out of gondar because of his jokes and, <laughs> and another time there's the same i think more very wrote that uh, tedros had told alaka gabrahanna just stop with your jokes really i've had fatanagast targum tsaf qalilen gento and uh, so we can say i can i can tell you one joke alaka gabrahanna not at not at people but this is a philosophical joke he was uh, in um, tigray and they had run out of food and uh, this is towards the end of tedi's time and his students bring a, a tiny piece of bread they divide it among themselves and after they've eaten it they say alaka give blessings and alaka responds ashof ashof bulo yiqotan al egziabher So <laughs> even God will be will laugh at us. Will be uh, uh, angry that we are giving him thanks for this. So these are the things that Alaka is known for, right? Because it, for those who don't get it, because it's so measly, uh, an, an a portion of of hospitality. <laughs> yes. It's a deep yeah. culture of hospitality, and so the expectations run high, and so you have to. It's a high context environment. You won't catch that joke unless you know the the levels of which people are competitive in their hospitality to outdo each other it's very contrary to the american culture in which perhaps people will try to get somebody else to pay for them uh in ethiopia you sometimes will enter into a fist fight over who gets to pay who gets the honor to pay yes yes and we we don't abandon this even outside ethiopia right when ethiopians get together it's still, um But let me tell you one more joke. That Please, you could tell us a million jokes. I I grew up for those who don't know, I grew up one of our babysitters growing up used to tell me about Alaka. Alaka by the way is a very interesting title. It it literally means chief or boss or something like that, but it refers to this class of debtera that we we keep talking about and bringing up, these cantors, but it's a really learned person amongst that class and I think usually it means that they haven't become a priest, although some of them may have later become priests as well they probably just went from the deacon phase to to there and there are a number of very famous learned 
people, especially those who who wrote and ed edited the Amharic and Ge'ez dictionaries over various times, who've, who've held this uh, title. And yeah. so Adaka is his title, and then uh, Gabrahanna, right, the slave of Anna, the, the grandmother of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, is his name. And I grew up with crazy stories of him, like, peeing off of a roof, tricking policemen into grabbing a pile of poo, like, all these crazy stories. I had no idea who he was, and then I get into the church later, and I hear that he's the founder of a certain style of aquaqua, which is this non-Eucharistic liturgical service. And it's like this great founder of, of a liturgical service is also this jokester. And I said, what is this juxtaposition? And Heywan was actually inferring to me that maybe he invented that style of lit liturgy in the first place itself as a joke. And so maybe his primary being is not as... Uh, a liturgical master, which is one of the side things he did, but as a jokester par excellence or a trickster. Wait, what, one thing that is very sad about Halek is uh, towards the end of his life, there were repeatedly he would be crying over his books, just feeling very sad for wasting his days, not teaching, but actually teasing and mocking people. So this is no, right? Uh, but Halek is a, is, a, is a scholar, is a serious scholar within the Ethiopian Orthodox Church, and he is a also the translator of Fitahanagast, not just translating from the, the law of kings. The law of kings. My, and, my friend David, I mentioned earlier, is doing his PhD thesis in history on the law of kings, and he's on a Fulbright scholarship right now in Ethiopia. And you know, Alek is, is very much respected as a scholar. This is why he could stay at Minilik's court, at Theodros's court, at Johann. He was useful as a scholar. He was just preoccupied with his jokes. He annoyed, he annoyed a lot of people with his jokes, right? But this is He's not, a hero of mine. <laughs> it's not unrelated, right? Because for you to be able to to master Amharic and Giz that well, you have to know the verbs very well. And Amharic verbs can have from two to three different meanings. And it takes one to have studied the language very well to know how to make jokes that easily. It's, a local that. teacher told me that if you look at the gus or the infinitive sets of, of meanings as well for the word kwane, he said there are 64 meanings. I was just about to tell you this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. This is one of the first things that my gus teacher told me, that one verb, kwane, has a lot of meanings. Yeah. And so it is not unrelated, right? It, it makes sense that a lot of people who have mastered uh, languages are, are quite well-versed. <laughs> so Alekadirahana does not like his neighbor who has donkeys. And uh, one morning, as they were walking across from one another, the man says, Aleka, good morning. And he says, and the respectful form. Aleka says, Xavieri Meskin, and it had derachu to the man. And and this is the joke in it. When he says and it had derachu, Aleka is not supposed to respect the man, but to use the puller verb to show that he categorizes the man with the donkeys. So he... Uh, he yeah. <laughs> <laughs> which, which itself, which itself, you know, is the, the butt of many jokes. In English and in Amharic, the word donkey, the proper term donkey, is actually used as an insult. I have had teachers who are of Ethiopian descent and they're newer to English and they would ask me, am I allowed to say this word? Because different translations, if you look at the King James Bible and stuff, it'll either say ass or jackass, which is the technical term for donkey. But it has become used in common parlance as a sidib, as a as an insult so many times that people think it's a it's a a word that's not proper, but it's exactly that word is in the Bible, is exactly that beast of burden, right? That the the Lord rides into Jerusalem triumphantly on. And so it's uh yeah that's crazy. <laughs> you, so he's playing with the the Amharic has this funny thing uh, in Spanish it's called the usted form and in French the vous which is that formal verse informal. English used to have that by the way. English the people look at the thys and these in older English in archaic English and they think that that is more formal. What's funny is that actually was used by the egalitarian Quakers and other groups and other Anabaptists. It was used to insult the, the aristocrats, the kings, because that's actually thy, thee, thine, all that is informal. It's saying anta anchi. Um, so what English did 
is they adopted the Antu for everyone. So you is Antu. So imagine if in Amharic we got rid of the gendered language and just referred to everybody in that plural or respectful form. That, that's what English did. Okay, so then it is the respectful form that we're using because I did not know. Yeah, but, in, in English, but but used to every applied to everybody so that the aspect of respect is gone. I don't know if Gu'ez has ever had it. What I do know is in the liturgy, we do not use that form in Gu'ez. I don't think it has. I don't, yeah. The plural is there, the respect for, I'm not sure. This, But we can ask. There are yeah. some we can ask about this. Yeah, I, ju I just know from experience, even when people have transitioned mm -hmm. from Gu'ez to Amharic in the liturgy, because it's the space of the liturgy, it's they use the singular form rather than the, the informal form. For example, when referencing a patriarch or a bishop, that in any other scenario, even as soon as you go outside of liturgy mode and begin teaching, you'd begin speaking about them in the plural or the, the respectful form. But in the process of the liturgy, I have seen them not only use the informal form. And I've always found something beautiful about that, like an equalizing factor in a I, I, very stratified hierarchical that might be the reason why they don't use their respectful form there. Yeah. Because outside, they usually actually, even for young deacons and, and priests, they call one another Antu or so, and it's not. Yeah. Yeah, but anyways, the joke was not over. You see, you interrupted the joke and then you went on a. Kayikar <laughs> Tagar. <laughs> um, but so later on, later on, when he finds out that he's been insulted, he returns and he beats up Anaka. And Alaka had to, he, he was bedridden for a few days. And the man comes with his wife, pretending to not know what happened, to ask, and they not, uh, to ask after Alaka's health. And he asks, what happened? And Alaka responds, and a donkey beat me up. <laughs> and he repeats the same joke that, yeah. So these, this is the foundation to the thesis, right? Alaka Gabrahanna and his jokes and, and how humor was seen, the, the cultural value of humor in Ethiopia then, and um, this is how it progressed. This is this is the foundation of my thesis. Yeah. That's so it's so beautiful, and I don't know if you've ever drawn this connection, but I have several friends who are good at what's called inkas salamta. Are you familiar with that? It's a it's a more vulgar tradition for those who don't know, but more <laughs> contemporary Addis Ababa tradition. It's basically a series of yo mama jokes, but sometimes it goes outside of that. You know, it yeah. might insult the person's loved ones in other areas or just insult the person themselves. And you you use the kind of, I think, long tradition of entendres, double entendres, wax and gold layered meaning to create all these insults that are laid at, at people. And I think that it's a sort of modern manifestation of this this Kine history, this Giz poetry history that you're talking about. D do you or anyone you know have they ever explored that idea? That's a free idea for someone in case they haven't. But mm, this is interesting because you you said that it was an Addis Ababa culture. I don't think it was. I think it is a um, northern Ethiopian um, tradition mostly. Because growing up, we do not use in Casalanta once or twice from TV shows that we've uh, taken. That's how at least I was raised in Addis Ababa. We do not. So have the reason I say that, and um, I could be totally wrong, right? This is not an evidence-based thing. This is very anecdotal. So I just want to say that before I say what I'm going to say. <laughs> I I came into myself in Amharic, uh, and I still couldn't roll my R's. So Amarinya dazi arana ber. But I was 16 and I was in Ethiopia and the, the Amharic I knew came from my grandmothers, my grandfather, my father, my aunts, and my uncles. So what that meant is I had a very Choa Amharic. I had a very innocent and kind Amharic. The worst things that I knew how to say in terms of insult came from whatever my parents would have called me. Okay. And that's that's the worst thing, you know, balegich, I'm like, uh, like you naughty boy, you know, something like that. Those are the worst things. And so when I was 16 and hanging out with high schoolers, going out, you know, to the clubs, to the pool halls in, in Ethiopia, uh, when I was visiting over the summer, people began leveling insults at me. And when I would respond with the ones that I knew, they would just laugh at me and they would mock me because they said, who are you been around? And that was the first time in my life 
that I had to critically analyze, you know, the basis of the Amharic that I was accustomed to is predominantly from Amharic speakers of Addis Ababa in the time of the king who were living in the diaspora, who came to America in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, and some in, some of them in the 80s, but predominantly in the 60s and 70s. And then a little bit from my distant relatives who came from the countrysides of, of Gwandar and Shoa, a northern Shoa, who would have also lived in Diridawa and Harar and picked some of that, but not necessarily picked up the culture. And the reason I mention that is from what I understand, the Amharic that is spoken in Addis Ababa is seen as vulgar by the so-called uh, historical uh, Amharic-speaking places of what is now the Amhara region of Gwadjam, Gwandar, Wadlo, and Shoa. And the Amharic of Diredawa is seen as vulgar to the Amharic of Addis Ababa. And so the reason I say that is I have anecdotally experienced the Inka Salamta culture from many different people in Addis Ababa, as well as in the United States from people who grew up in Addis Ababa. And I could not fathom people in the North speaking that way. Uh, one joke that I had heard of was that there was an issue with a Northerner who had moved to Addis Ababa. Uh, you probably know this story before. It's probably a common one. And you know, somebody had insulted his mother and where he grew up in the north, that was worthy of, you know, killing somebody. So he he killed the person and he has to flee. So he flees to Diredawa and he begins going in the marketplace and he hears people using that insult he heard in Addis Ababa as a greeting in the marketplace. And he said, wow, what kind of like insane place have I come to? And what is he going to do? Because practically speaking, if his principle is I kill anybody who says something about someone's mother, is he going to kill everybody there? Like it just, it doesn't make sense. It's a clash of cultures. So I could be totally wrong. And this might be a gross overstatement, but that's just the, the personal experience I'm coming from in which I say that there's no evidence back study that I'm quoting. Um, I would say there's a, there's an interesting, um, I, there's a sense of ownership of uh, Amharic that most cities have over Amharic, right? But it does not seem to me that it matters so much what uh, the Gondari think uh, the Addis Ababa Amharic is, what the Addis Ababa Amhar uh, Amharic speakers think the Harar Amharic is or not. Each region in Ethiopia that speaks Amharic has its own flavor and its own um, taste that it brings. Harar, um, from, the mo from many jokes that I've heard and collected, seems to have a lot of vulgar words used in Amharic over Addis Ababa and Amharic. Uh, whereas in Gondar, it might not be that loose because also it reflects some sort of a, a serious Christian uh, culture that you cannot, you do not have to say everything out loud and all of that, right? So each region brings its own culture to the language itself. But I would not say, um, when you look at the words Amharic itself, I think Bogat Suyum had an interesting article about this. I don't know if you know Bogat Suyum. I don't. A comedian who has very interesting uh, writings about life in Ethiopia. And he has, he, it was a response to uh, Jawar Muhammad saying the culture of Ethiopia was is an Amhara culture until 1991. And he was uh, pulling out words from uh, uh, a certain Amharic uh, poetry book by Johannes Hadmaso, I think, where he was saying, look at the words in, in this poetry book and look at how many Oromingya words have been adopted as Amharic, how many Tigrinya words have been taken as Amharic. And, and then you tell me uh, if Ethiopian culture, if Amhara culture has been uh, oppressing others or if it is the other way around, that cultures have been uh, taken from one another throughout the years. And so I say the same about uh, the language in the, in the in Gondar, in Godjam, in Addis Ababa, and Harar, they take from whatever is around them. They take from one another, right? Um, but I was going to go back to something you said earlier. Um, About the origin of Inka Salamta. Is it from Addis Ababa or is it from one of the northern Amharic regions? Yes, from the way I was ra I was raised in Hayalit Mazore. And uh, most of the people there are, I'm the fir I'm a first generation Addis Ababa, meaning my father came from Samin Shah, my mother came from Wondo. And most of the families there are like that. And so the the cultural games we played, the, the Amharic games we played in Kok and Lesh, all of that growing up, mm -hmm. we from these people who came from Gondar, Shawa, um, 
Tigray, a lot, a lot from Mullaka as well. So in Casalantia, I was not, I did not hear it from my friends growing up. I heard it from these people who came from outside Addis Ababa. So it might not be uh, endemic to Addis Ababa, but I think, as you said, there are Addis Ababans who took it from abroad and then who who made it an Addis Ababa thing. To... Yeah, they may have they may have adapted it, maybe turned the the logic of the game up. Maybe it was more innocent before. One of the things you said stuck out to me because I used to study cross cultural dispute resolution, and in that field, it talks about various types of culture. You know, mon monochronic and polychronic is one distinction. You know, someone who's like a, a st stereotypical Habasha who's late versus someone who is very punctual and, and various other cultures. So within humor, you have the main distinction, which is supposedly highbrow humor versus slapstick, right? Slapstick is Charlie Chaplin pie in the face. And the thing about that Charlie Chaplin is like he's super popular in Ethiopia, because you don't need to understand that much English. You know, you can just understand the joke right there. It's very physical. And some people look down on it as a lower form of culture, how, you know, even even the way they describe it. Whereas highbrow might be, I don't know if you've ever seen either the UK or the American version of The Office. That's considered a high, like they take the soundtrack out. They expect you to figure out how to laugh, not be told to laugh by the Hollywood executive producers. And the the jokes are what is sometimes it's also called drier humor. And I think the British do this even better in terms of like to a higher degree than the Americans. And they've got a real dry humor to the point where some people know the words they're saying, but they don't find it funny. I, I found that myself where sometimes I would listen to certain Habasha comedians and some of them I like, but some of them, I understand what they're saying, but I just don't, you know, find it as funny. And, and that might be a cultural gap of me being the diaspora uh, guy that I am. Uh, Dave Chappelle, I think is the greatest comedian of all time. Uh, maybe you'll, you'll prove me wrong and it's Alec Agabrahanna instead. But what is funny is most people categorize him as highbrow, but he categorized himself almost as a lowbrow person slapstick and you know, the way he said it is he says, every joke I make goes back to a jokes about private parts or farting, but I hide it with a very elaborate narrative and story. And so, so he's almost like a crossbreed between those two. And so that, that's always been interesting to me. I bring that framework to say maybe Inka Salamta or these other jokes as they were practiced in the North are not various levels of vulgarity maybe all human beings have the same level of vulgarity but the way in which they say it is different so for example i used to you know buy into that kind of you know harar uh, i've been there too once uh, my grandma grew up there uh harar versus gondar distinction and one of the distinctions i think that is is uh, uh falls away is when I hear, for example, the song, and I don't know if it's from Gondar, but it's definitely from the north somewhere. Shagiye, 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 shagiye to. My uncle explained to me one of the lines of that song, which I used to sing along to and didn't know. And I was like, wow, it's super vulgar. It's not so innocent. It's super vulgar, but its vulgarity is layered. It's layered through the language. And so it they use euphemism and story and narrative an indirect language, whereas maybe the uniqueness of the humor coming out of a Harar or Diredawa is that it's more taboo breaking because it's it's direct. It's hak engyats katatengyat, straightforward, as opposed to that. So it you know it's about what your personal or cultural taboo is. Is your taboo the ultimate meaning, which you know the mystery the mystery meaning of the North might be even more vulgar than the one in the South, but the South is just more straightforward, and that exists in the United States, by the way. Midwestern and Southern people are considered more indirect and more like Northern Ethiopians. And then uh, cosmopolitan areas like LA, where I'm from, are considered straightforward. But to a fault, DC, New York, Boston are considered even more. Like DC, New York, Boston, especially New York and Boston, and especially Boston, are considered more like Diredawa and Harar. But you see, even the distinction of Northern and Southern falls away when you see that, for example, the words that, um, that I use to, to categorize humor. Chawata uh, is the main thing, right? Uh, it's play or game. Yes, and that's what most of the dictionaries are like. Kiran uh, uh, and all of these dictionaries define Chawata as, as game. And then there's phase Bwalt that is used by the older generation of Ethiopians, no matter where they are or where they come from, 
to denote what young Ethiopians today um, joke and 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 say as jokes, which is it's for them it, it's not high quality humor. So from mm -hmm. my father would not laugh at a joke that my my little brother uh, heard in the streets and we, we would say this, this is what. But then a layered form of uh, an Asmari, uh, like it might be an incredibly sexual joke that is made by an Asmari, and my father would find that very sophisticated and it's, it's a good chata, right? And so yeah. there's an intergenerational thing in this. And I was going to come to my third chapter focuses on uh, political leaders and how our leaders use humor. So there's a sense of, um, as a tool, as a rhetorical tool, being able to speak sophisticatedly is not just it in Ethiopia, but also uh, entertaining. And being able to use humor and wit in a sophisticated way is also respected in, in uh, rulers and leaders. And even if you're making a, a vulgar joke, if you deliver it well, and it's through a lot of, um, if it takes you some time to understand what that person is saying, there is ultimately some weight that comes to, that you're given in Ethiopian public sphere, and I also investigate that. I just wanted to mention, yeah. Well, I am I am very much looking forward to it. Anything more, and uh, <laughs> but but I'm not agba chalan. So zilai ben nakwacho melkam no. You are always welcome if you have any particular areas of history or humor or you know if you want to do even a five minute G is lesson of the day video yeah we're always going to throw it up on on this youtube channel so uh i i'll quit thank you Henoki. stay well yeah